Good morning. I'm very happy to be here in this Living Science uh, uh, program and uh, very happy to, to meet all of you and also, I guess, several people who will watch this online. Uh, very happy to meet all of you as well. Um, what, uh, what we had discussed was that I'll start off with a short presentation um, about uh, you know, the, uh, the work that I've been involved in for the last 15, uh, 20 years or so now uh, around genomics and uh, in particular I'll give a quick overview of uh, uh, the innovation and uh, uh, involved in taking genomics uh, into precision medicine and, uh, and, but, and try to localize it in the context of what this means in India and, uh, um, and you know, in many ways, uh, uh, as the slide says, we have actually been very successful in localizing various technologies, right? Um, uh, in, uh, before we started Strand, we were the guys who also built the computer, so, so you know, we, we had learned how to also localize for computing technologies and Indian language technologies and so on. So uh, and now, now we are working more in the healthcare space. So uh, now uh, the reason there's all this excitement about genomics and, and its applications in precision medicine has to do with a, with a very uh, simple idea, right? I mean, we are uh, essentially uh, in an era where we are witnessing exponential technologies. I think people call it singularities and so on. Uh, but uh, just to remind ourselves uh, is the story of uh, the chessboard and rice grains, right? So, so the old fable in Indian mythology is that there is, uh, you know, the, the king is very impressed with, uh, with this uh, man who has come with the chessboard and you know they play the game and he wants to give him a reward and the man says, listen, I'm just a poor man, I, I just want some food for my family, so just put one grain of rice on the first square, two on the second, four on the third and so on. And the king says, of course, granted, right? Without realizing that by the time it, get, it gets to 32 squares, it's somewhere in the order of 4 billion grains, uh, which is uh, about, you know, the yield of a, of a medium-sized farm. And if you was to actually go to all 64 squares, it would be, you know, in the quintillions, uh, as, as, the, as it shows in the table there. And if you made it the mound of rice, it would be taller than Mount Everest, right? And that much rice is simply not not grown, right? So, so the king realizes that uh, you know he can't keep his promise. Um, and then the the sage who has uh, taken him through this exercise of understanding exponentiality, then says, you know, uh, not to worry. Uh, but henceforth, if anyone comes to the palace, you have to feed them rice pisum. Right, and so this is called the fable of the rice parson, and the sage is actually supposed to be Lord Krishna. So, so for Indians, I think uh, exponentiality should be something we understand very, very innately. But um, you know, there are two laws in technology which have been very exciting from from this perspective of exponential growth. Right. Uh, one law is, of course, as we all know, Moore's law, and today you know, the computer in your smartphone is, is a supercomputer that we all thought of as supercomputers when we first learned to program in the 70s and, and 80s. So, um, and why is that? Because tech, uh, the technology has been doubling every 18 months. And this has been going on since 1958 or so, right? Uh, now, uh, there is another law which is like Moore's law, which is again an, uh, uh, an exponential law, and which is the cost of genome sequencing, which has been moving along with Moore's law till about 2007 when there was an inflection point. And that inflection point was the start of something called next-gen sequencing, 
This is actually done by a, a chemist of Indian origin, uh, uh, Shankar Subramaniam, who is a professor of chemistry at Cambridge in England. He's now been knighted, so we should call him Sir Professor Shankar Subramaniam. And um, he uh, created a machine called the Solexa machine, which then later was acquired by Illumina. And the law has been named after, you know, the commercial success uh, story because Jay flatly bought the Solexa company for Illumina and then, you know, and basically has built, built this out into a huge empire now. And, um, and it, the exponential law for genomics is actually moving at the square of Moore's law. So it's actually moving much faster, right? So just to keep in mind that uh, internal cause of uh, sequencing a whole human genome today is about three to four hundred dollars, okay, at Illumina, right? Uh, you won't get it at that price, <laughs> but that's that's the cost. Um, the um, the cost of doing the f first human genome, let's say, well, you, you shouldn't count because institutions had to be built and so on. But the second human genome cost three hundred million dollars, right? And that was around two thousand three. So from three hundred million dollars, it has come to three hundred dollars. So so you, and this is what in fifteen years. 14 years, so, right? So, so you can see that there's something very special going on, and and one of the impacts of that is precision medicine. That's what we're going to to sort of talk a little bit more about. You can also think of these as second half technologies. Now, Moore's law entered second half of the chessboard in um, 2006-2007, right? So once it reaches the second half, you know how an exponential curve works, right? It basically becomes very vertical after that. And that's what we're witnessing today. You know, we're seeing AI or, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles and all kinds of phenomenon because we are in the second half of Moore's law. Uh, the same thing will happen with, with genomics as well. And when is that second half going to happen? It happened this year. So we're already two days apart, 32, right? So now, now we start seeing the effects of of the singularity in genomics, right? Um, this has been well recognized. I think uh, President Obama, in particular, you know, uh, made a big commitment. He said we're going to now introduce. It's called the the Precision Medicine Initiative of President Obama, and they're going to sequence one million. U.S. citizens, right, and uh, get the whole genomes, and then, and then build actually on top of that, right, uh, complete health records, and and um, and so so they will monitor the health of, of these individuals. And the sense is that eventually we'll get to a point where, uh, along with your Aadhaar card, as soon as you're born, you'll get you'll get your genome, right, <laughs> sequence and then, and then, you know, that will be the basis on which many, many of uh, your health decisions particularly will be maintained. We will sequence microbes, we will sequence plants, we will sequence the, you know, the animal kingdom. We will, we will essentially sequence everything we can get our hands on, <laughs> right, because it will become, it will become ubiquitous technology and all of that is going to affect the science. It's going to affect how, how we do the science and so on. So just to give you a little bit of historical context, I think uh, the first real instance where you could say precision medicine was beginning to play a role was in this little boy's life. Uh, this boy called, uh, I think, Nick Volker, right? Nicholas Volker. Uh, he was, uh, you know, had gone through something like 40 odd surgeries and he was having all kinds of difficulties uh, primarily with the digestive system but but also other other complications and uh, they finally had couldn't quite diagnose what the challenge was and and they wanted uh, to to figure out if uh, if there was some sort of an immune deficiency which uh, which could be corrected, right? And so his whole genome was sequenced, 
and this was around 2009 at uh, at the University of Wisconsin, now Milwaukee. Uh, the the medical campus is in Milwaukee, and uh, so uh, once they sequenced it, they uh, they were able to realize that it was an immunodeficiency. Did a bone marrow transplant, and and he's fine now. I, I met his mother last month. Uh, she showed pictures of him, you know, in school, running around, and so on. So, so it's uh, that was sort of a poster child of of uh, precision medicine, and um, and it's been made into a book, uh, you know, and it won the Pulitzer Prize, and so on. So, so it's uh, um, the other sort of uh, uh, in the news story has been, of course. Uh, uh, this remarkably courageous woman, uh, Angelina Jolie, who, you know, because of her hereditary uh, risks, um, was told that her uh, um, her risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer uh, was somewhere in the high 80s uh, as a percent percentage risk, right? So, so because her mother and her aunt had had uh, there was a family history of early death and early uh, uh, onset of disease and she had the same markers right and um, so in her case she had not yet got the disease but she knew she was at risk and so she looked at options uh, prophylactic of options and she took them right and she was bold enough to come out and talk about it and you know it obviously put her career at risk and, and so on but, uh, but, uh, but she has done a human service now to at least make spread the awareness and um, so um, I think you know you have uh, so this now this doesn't mean that everyone who has risk has to have surgery there is there's a process of counseling and so on that uh, a person who has hereditary risk has to go through and uh, depending on the amount of risk and so on uh, the 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 counselor will will take uh, will take you will take the person through the steps now the uh, there is also uh, uh, situations where the, the patient is already diagnosed with cancer let's say breast cancer and you still want to do the hereditary test because then the treatment for the patient changes uh, if if it is diagnosed that it was a hereditary factor that that caused caused the cancer so so you know this is used both for patients and for relatives of patients or uh, so or what are called unaffected so today just to give you a sense in the US about 500,000 of these tests are done a year about a hundred thousand are on patients and who have already been diagnosed with cancer and about 400,000 are for unaffected relatives of patients, right? And that number is only increasing, the number of unaffected uh, who are getting tested. Uh, um, for those of you who have no knowledge of biology and uh, genomes and so on, uh, just think of it as, as, as a book, right? Of long uh, list of characters, the ACGT code, uh, which is actually um, in, uh, in arranged in something called chromosomes, there are about 23 chromosomes and all of this is basically folded up and inside your cells. So uh, you, you're, you inherit these one copy from the father, one copy from the mother and then this, uh, this uh, you know is something that you carry for life. Uh, it can mutate and uh, sometimes those mutations can cause problems but uh, but otherwise this is kind of the code that that uh, that builds your physiology in some sense and but this can be affected by the environment as well so 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 there is the, just to keep that in mind don't have to be fatalistic about it but it's uh, it, it is uh, an important part of the code um, so in this code, uh, it's about three billion letters long. So actually, if you printed it out and stacked it up, it would be about seven stories high, right? Uh, but if you, uh, but some pieces of it, maybe about two percent of it, actually are today understood to to code 
for about uh, 20,000 genes and uh, maybe about a few uh, 100 to 200,000 proteins which are expressed by those genes right? and all that is in, is in that code. So, uh, and, uh, and this, uh, these fractions that actually comprise of the genes um, could be in you know disparate pieces uh, but uh, you know the, the, the body, the body chemistry essentially is able to then put those pieces together, figure out the the contiguous code, and then then express the protein based on that code. Right? So so that is uh, that's how it all works. And uh, now when we're sequencing the genome, we're, since it's three billion letters long, uh, you can imagine that it would be extremely hard to just pull it through some process and get the entire string. Right. Uh, so what what uh, in fact, what this next gen sequencing idea that uh, came up in uh, you know about ten years ago was uh, why not chop up the d the DNA into smaller pieces and sequence those smaller pieces, and you can do that in parallel. So you you get massive parallelism, uh, but then you've you've got pieces, and now you've got to reassemble the whole thing, right? And um, so, so that is uh, that reassembly problem is called the genome assembly or genome alignment problem because um, once we had the reference genome worked out, then you could align against the reference genome. But till the first reference genome was was created, you you basically had to assemble. Now these are very complex dynamic programming problems, stochastic dynamic programming problems, and and computationally very intensive, uh, but but it, you know it's been cracked. So that's been one of the one of the uh, you know nice areas where computational biology has worked really well. And today uh, there are supercomputers that can actually solve this whole problem of reassembly and alignment uh, for human genome in about thirty minutes. Uh, at Strand, we do it in about five hours on a multi-thread architecture with Tesla boards running GPUs and being able to do do some of the parallel computations. So, so it's uh, it's you know in some sense uh, getting to be a solved problem. But uh, right. um, but then after you assemble it, uh, you know you have to you have to read out what you see as patterns, right? So now here what has been done is there's a reference sequence in black and below it are all the little pieces that align with that reference sequence. And now you look down a column. You look down a column and you see that in the reference sequence there was an A and in the column you have T's, right? So, so obviously there's uh, something is off, right? And that's you know it's a polymorphism. So there is there is something off, uh, and um, now if it is consistently T right through, that sort of shows that it's a you know it's it's a variant of, of in both copies. It's not just in one copy, and so that is called a homozygous variant. And you also have heterozygous where you'd get about half and half, right? And um, so, so this is this is more like a, a heterozygous uh, variant. Uh, now, typically, uh, I mean, this is for illustration we have shown here. But let's say if you are studying the DNA of a cancer patient, um, you would take about a thousand copies. So you would actually take a thousand copies of the the, the genome, chop it, uh, chop it up, and uh, and then when you do the alignment, you actually get hundreds and hundreds of rows and so you, your accuracy of what you are reading out is gets that much higher. So the more depth you have uh, the better the accuracy is. Right. Now there are obviously thousands and thousands and millions of, of, uh, of these uh, various m mutations or changes or variants that we see um, and uh, you know these are uh, what I have listed here are what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs or SNPs and uh, you know 
you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of them around. In fact, you can buy arrays with a million SNPs on them, or two million SNPs on them, and so on. Um, and um, on which you can do various experiments. But um, so, so, you know, how on earth do you make sense of all of this? What do each of them mean? What do they mean for you? What do they mean for patients in general? And so on, right? So, so there, there's, there's a whole sort of workflow that has to happen now to say that, you know, I've taken a patient sample and I've come up with, let's say, 13,500 variants of various kinds. Now, the variants could be just flipping of letters, they could be insertions, they could be deletions, they could be various structural variants and, and so on, right? So, all types of uh, variants, but um, let's say we get tens of thousands of such variants. Now, how do we actually come down to that single variant or a couple of variants that, that are probably causing the, the disease and match with the symptoms and so on. And this is where you have to invoke a lot of knowledge uh, of the, the clinical world and all the, the correlations between uh, you know, these variants and phenotypes or you know, actual symptoms that, that uh, may have been seen in the patients and so on. And this corresponds to going to literature. Um, there's today maybe about 23 million publications in Medline and, and PubMed uh, which are related to all of this. Uh, you'd have to negotiate all of that knowledge and, and, and interpret uh, what it means here. Um, that's obviously a, a big challenge uh, in terms of it can be done. Uh, if you were to do it with Google searches, it would take you a little while. Uh, so, so people have started organizing these, this knowledge into, into databases. There are many public databases. I think we've listed some there, you know, uh, Klimvar, HGMD, Arup, uh, OMIM, and so on. And so you can actually in, invoke some of these public databases. Um, and um, you know, you can also build your own, right, uh, by curating all of this literature. And, um, and I think um, one of the questions that keeps coming up is, you know, aren't Indians different? Aren't South Asians different? Why are we just using all this knowledge that has come from, from the West, right? And, and, you know, it is true. And I think we do need to build our own South Asian genome uh, you know, variant databases and so on. And it's starting to happen. I think, you know, I was recently at CCMB and I, you know, I think we've decided at least at Strand, that Strand will work with CCMB and start pooling our knowledge and building, building sort of a, a, a common database. Uh, at Strand, we, we've also, uh, I mean, there are a bunch of computer scientists, right, who started Strand. So, so, so we also like to use technology. <laughs> and uh, so when we were faced with this challenge, what we said is, you know, let's build a natural language processing system that can actually go out there, read the literature, do text mining, and help the productivity of the curation effort, right? And uh, we've done that. And, uh, you know, while IBM has uh, its Watson, we have our Ramanujan. Right. <laughs> so the reason we've called it Ramanujan is that it actually has, um, Ramanujan, you know, there were two Ramanujans. Most of you, uh, you know, obviously know the Ramanujan mathematician, uh, and there is a lot of number crunching that happens in the system. But uh, there's also the Ramanujan, the linguist, right? And uh, you know, so there's a lot of lang language constructs involved here. We actually wrote uh, an engine called Grammatica, which is, uh, encodes the, um, the English grammar. Uh, and um, in, it's, it's actually uh, quite, uh, quite interesting to, to do this as an exercise. Um, you know, that automaton uh, over there is the grammar for a ver verb, right? And it's actually, uh, you know, quite complicated to encode the rules of grammar uh, and um, but anyway, uh, we built this way back in 2005, 
and uh, it's been reading PubMed since then. And it can actually read a, a sentence like that, which is, now the good thing is in research publications, language is pretty formal, right? If you were reading blogs or Twitter uh, tweets, I know God help you, right? <laughs> it's it's uh, because people use all kinds of informal ways of communicating. But in research publications, it's actually quite, quite formal. And you can actually extract with about 85% or so accuracy uh, knowledge from that. And then on top of that, you do human curation to, to make sure you've, you've done the right interpretation. So, so this is how uh, we've, we've pieced this whole thing together. And um, um, so I'll skip this because it sort of actually gets into the architecture of the system and so on. But, but you can understand that it's a, it's a, it's a fairly complex system. Um, then, you know, how do you know you're doing the right things? The only way is you, you have to, you know, get tested, right? So, so there are these boards like the NABL, the National Accreditation for Biolabs, which can actually come and test what you do, check to make sure that you have all the processes to make sure that you have the quality. So, it's actually an ISO standard. And then the College of American Pathologists actually also have an accreditation process. I'm very happy to say that Strand is the only lab in South Asia to have received the CAP accreditation to do this next gen sequencing type of work, right? So we, we are today world class in that sense that the, there is no difference in quality that you would get by going to a Baylor or a Foundation Medicine or a, or a Broad Institute and what you would get at that strand. Right? So I'll, I'll just quickly touch on some, some of the impact of all of this as we are seeing in India as, as rolling out uh, from what strand has been offering. We've been actually doing this clinical work only for the last two years, two, two and a half years. Um, from 2001 to 2012, we actually built the tools that were involved in annotation of the human genome. So people were doing experiments to try to figure out where are the genes, what do these genes do, how do they express, uh, and you know, do they overexpress, do they underexpress, does one regulate the other. Now these are all experiments that were done by research biologists and they needed analytic tools to be able to understand all of that. And so Strand was in the business of building all those analytic tools, right? And so we survived as a company doing that for over 10 years. And then when we saw this whole shift happening into an application into healthcare, we actually became uh, a healthcare company as well. So, so, so that's, uh, that's been sort of the story of Strand. But now in the last couple of years, we started having this impact in, in precision medicine and I'd like to just share with you a couple of things. So we, we talked about the Angelina Jolie story, right? Now we have done it now, we've done similar tests now in India for roughly around 2,500 uh, cohorts, right? Uh, the cohort size is about 2,500. And um, of course, uh, in about uh, maybe Two thirds of those cases are for breast and ovarian cancer, but we also check for things like colon cancer and uh, other cancers, right? Um, now, the interesting thing is actually, particularly if you look at the the bottom uh, diagram there, it's um, it's um, uh, on the on the left is um, um, the uh, you know. Uh, the number of cases that are positive, right, and, and um, uh, the the red uh, sort of wedge is um, uh, actually of the people tested, 30 percent turned out to actually have hereditary factors, but there is some indication that there could be some change differences. Um, I'll, uh, uh, Actually, this is a very busy slide, so, so I'm not going to say very much except to say that one part is the hereditary part, the other part is you're actually looking at the cancer 
DNA itself. You're taking tumor, extracting the DNA from the tumor, and saying what went wrong here, right? And by figuring out what went wrong there, to, uh, what were the mutations or the variants that drove the cancer, then you can match that to therapy and say, you know, this is the chemotherapy that will work better, this is the targeted therapy that might work. And, um, and that is what you're starting to reach into precision medicine with, right? So there's sort of a pharmacological uh, implication of, uh, of what you're getting from, from the genome. And how much of, uh, of this uh, uh, are we seeing being used in India? It's still in the early stages. I think, again, you know, they've done probably uh, over a thousand cases so far, right? And, um, and we have, and you know, th uh, there are various considerations of, of cost and so on, which I'll, which I'll also address in a minute. But uh, um, these, these have now become kind of standard of care in the West, right? They're now more and more um, in, in um, whether, you know, you go to Dana-Farber or MD Anderson or Cancer Care Centers of America or whatever, they're, they will do this, uh, this type of multi-gene testing of the, of the tumor. So this is, this is sort of the brave new world where um, we will be able to actually read tumor signal from blood. So we won't even have to do a biopsy. Uh, you can actually just take a blood draw and in that blood, uh, say 10 ml of blood, you will actually have enough tumor cells that you can, uh, and the cell-free DNA that spills into the blood can then be, uh, you know, detected and measured and, and, and read, and, uh, and you would be able to detect cancer early, you would be able to um, also, in many cases where getting a biopsy is difficult because of the location of the, of the lesions or the tumors and so on, you'd, you'd be able to, to get this information. So this is a, a, an R&D effort, it's a global R&D effort, and right now at Strand, it's, uh, it's you know, a big focus for us for two reasons. One is that uh, we're already seeing uh, doctors asking for this uh, for monitoring patients who've been treated. So you want to now see whether it, the cancer is coming back or if the minimal res residual disease is, uh, is you know, gone away uh, and and instead of you know waiting for a PET scan say at the end of a year or so you you can you know do this more frequently and and actually see if if the disease is coming back so so these uh, liquid biopsy tests are are starting to be sort of the future right in in in, in this whole area uh, you can imagine that if you if you, if this could be brought down to, I don't know, 5,000 rupees, right? Um, you could just make it part of an annual checkup package, right? So if someone was a, as a male smoker at the age of 50, right, uh, they should be checked, right? Because, you know, I think there is reasonable risk that, that, that they could be onset of, of cancer and uh, and I you know and the earlier you catch detect cancer um, you know there's much more that you can do for the patient right? so the the real trick is to catch catch cancer early and and so this is being seen as, as sort of the uh, the screening technique that that will be used in the future now, uh, you can do it with blood, you can do it with saliva, you can do it with urine, uh, you know, depending on the, the cancers and what you're looking for and so on. So, so there, there's, there's, a, there's that uh, future that's coming up. Then finally, there's, uh, uh, there are cases like that, that boy, Nicholas Volker, where, uh, you know, the people are born with certain Mendelian disorders, as they're called, or, or monogenic diseases, and and in many cases, uh, you know, they they go through uh, difficulty of 
proper diagnosis and now that you know this sequencing technologies and so on are around we are able to, to resolve many of these uh, uh, issues. So I will not show a lot of the data except to say that again this is this particular data set is for about a thousand patients and you know you see neurological disorders, inborn uh, uh, metabolism errors, um, it is usually called inborn errors of metabolism, uh, skeletal disorders, cardiac disorders, dermatological disorders, of ophthalmic eye disorders and actually there are about 7000 such diseases. And in many cases, they are very rare in the sense that, you know, one in 10,000 or one in 20,000 or, you know, one in 100,000 children actually have this. But, but, uh, but when they have this, uh, you know, getting the right diagnosis um, in the West takes five years, right? Uh, today, I think, you know, that time is getting shrunk so that at least treatment treatment can be much more targeted uh, earlier, right. Um, again, I do not want to go into a lot of the details about the statistics and so on, but uh, again, we, we have some interesting comparisons with some of the western centers. Um, for those of you who just like a very nice pedagogic introduction to all of this. Uh, um, IIC Press will be issuing this book um, written by your IIT Delhi alum uh, Ramesh Haryaran who has um, uh, written an extraordinary uh, you know, uh, book in the sense that these are case studies and uh, each of them is written, it has been written in a kind of uh, Conan Doyle style, right? each is a detective story. So, so it's it's a lot of fun to read, and uh, it's it's already there free and on Kindle uh, in Amazon. So, if you if you are into Amazon, I think just go and uh, uh, I mean, it, and you don't mind reading books on Kindle, uh, it's already available, right? But uh, uh, you can uh, the the book will actually come out in print shortly. ISC Press is here with the, all these exponential laws and what is happening whether it is in precision medicine or other applications that we are going to see whether it is in electronics and robotics and AI and you know uh, the future is really going to belong to this um, ability to do recombinant innovation being able to build pieces you know take pieces building blocks and actually do recombinant innovation and build nice applications. Okay. I think fundamental breakthroughs are going to be harder and harder to do and only somebody like Elon Musk can, can actually fund those, right. But, uh, but you know I think what a lot of us can do is you know do recombinant stuff, right. And so this, this whole idea of meta ideas is, uh, is how to you know how to do that and and you know if you look at the successes of recent successes of things like uh, Uber and <laughs> you know uh, Waze and Google Maps and you know it's all just ideas just being put together it's not there's nothing that fundamental about it I mean the internet was fundamental it, and that uh, you know somebody had to pay for to, to make that happen. Uh, but uh, but a lot of that after that everything everything is um, is sort of incremental. Uh, I can't uh, end without actually acknowledging uh, the, the 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 foursome. Uh, so we were four professors in ISC in computer science, and we actually had a lab together called the Perceptual Computing Lab, and. Uh, so everything that we have done in this the whole entrepreneurial sort of journey has been together, uh, and all. The, so I've already mentioned. Uh, so in the right picture, because it's more current, uh, you see Ramesh on the extreme left, uh, Ramesh Hariharan. Uh, next to him is of course I'm there, and then there's Swami Manohar, and Swami Manohar was the one of the principal guys who built the Simputer, right. And uh, Swami uh, Manohar is now head of virtual reality at Microsoft Research. 
and uh, next to him is Vinay and Vinay, uh, V. Vinay also a computer scientist, uh, uh, a very creative guy, he runs something called uh, JEDI, Joy of Engineering Design and Innovation. Um, and JEDI is now building an autonomous vehicle. So sometime later this year, they'll do their first test run inside ISC. Uh, it'll be a, a small vehicle that will run run on the tracks there. So, so you know, uh, but we've stayed together. We're all uh, uh, been together uh, in both journeys, the Simputer and and Strand. Uh, and um, you know, there's uh, the word entrepreneur itself uh, is probably a French word. Some must come from some Latin base or something like that. But uh, uh, I think it's, you can also pretend that it's a Sanskrit word, right? Uh, and so, you know, it sort of sounds like antaprena, right? Which is, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, it's, it just means self-motivated. Which seems like a perfect description of an entrepreneur. Um, and um, you know, so I think working in a team has been really helpful. I think uh, you know, it would have been very hard to do these. Remember that when Strand and Pico Pita Simputers, which was the Simputer company, were floated in 2000 and 2001, these were the first time in India that professors were allowed to start a company and remain professors. Right. And IIC sort of did this as a bold experiment. And, um, and so, you know, the fact that we, we, we were a team actually really helped in taking this forward. So. Thank you and bye-bye.